Uh, welcome uh, to this event this evening on Ukraine, the war that changed and is still changing the world. Uh, let me first say who I am. My name is Professor Michael Cox, or Mick Cox. I was in the IR department for many years. I was then director of LSC Ideas. Uh, and now I am doing lots and lots of other things as well in and around the LSE. So it's very nice to be back here in the Hong Kong Theatre, which I actually first talked in about 20 years ago. So it's very nice to be back here. And also nice to be back with a very full audience. Uh, clearly the subject matter for this evening is one that needs wide and uh, interesting and important uh, debate. The title itself suggests how we want to structure this, although not everything is going to focus on something called the world or the global. It will also focus on Ukraine and Russia uh, as well. This, by the way, is one of three events now being organized by, by the school uh, reflecting on the war in, in Ukraine. There's been much discussion, as I'm sure you're aware, about the causes of the war, much disputed and much debated, as any war is bound to be. Uh, about the consequences of the war, both for Ukraine, most obviously, but also for Russia, and also, thirdly, for Europe and European security. Uh, but this event also uh, looks more broadly, tries to, at the global consequences. What started as what we might define in a rather kind of banal way as a regional conflict has spread out to impact on the world economy, every single state in the world today, and indeed every international and regional organization. Hence the title of our seminar debate uh, this evening. In brief, it has made the world economy more fragile, more vulnerable. It has compelled every state in the world to make a choice even if the choice is to remain officially neutral. And it has drawn in all organizations from NATO to the BRICS, to the G20, the United Nations inevitably, and of course the European Union. The war has also raised two other major issues and many more beside, but two worth mentioning here tonight. One about the role of China in the world, given its close relationship with Russia, which goes back a very long way, of course, and more generally about the direction in which the international order is moving, because many have given this war a much wider definition and given it much wider meaning, arguing that what this war is about, not just about a war in Ukraine, but also a war for the future of the world, or to put it in ways that sometimes Putin and others put it, we're moving away from a defunct uh, liberal world order or rules-based world order, whatever you want to call it, to something new. And that's certainly how Russia and indeed China have seen it, towards a multipolar world order or not. So that's the framing of the debate tonight. Uh, we have four excellent speakers, all from, from the school, from LSE. The running order this evening will be, I'll start with my good friend, Professor Tamil Alankino, from the IR department. I'll move on to uh, Dr. Eleanor Knott from the management department to think about Russia and Ukraine. We'll then move to Chris Alden uh, from the IR department, but now director uh, of ideas to look at the global south and perspectives from the global south and how people or many people or some people or some estates view the war in rather different ways to the global north or the west, whatever you want to call it. And then last but by no means least on the end there, Professor Robert Faulkner from the IR department to look at the impact of the war on energy and climate change. We can't talk about everything, but I think we're talking about a lot tonight. And also worth remembering that this is still unfinished business. So where we will be in one year's time or six months' time, I don't know. So this, in a sense, is a work in progress, which flows, by the way, from a recent uh, publication by LSE Press through Public Policy Review, which you can get online, a journal with many, many other articles within it, other than some of the issues we'll be talking about tonight. And all of the speakers this evening appear 
in that particular online journal with public policy review and organized here by LSE Press and also by the School of Public Policy. Finally, uh, I would also like to dedicate this event uh, to the memory of a good friend, a colleague, Christopher Coker. Christopher recently passed away, too early. He was 40 years at the LSE. He was a brilliant strategic thinker, a wonderful teacher, and is much missed. So for this evening, with your permission, I would like to dedicate this event to him. And by the way, coincidentally, the very first essay in the special issue is by Christopher Coker. And it's a wonderful piece of work, typical Christopher. So, with no more ado, I'd like you to give a very warm LSE welcome to our first speaker, Tamila Lankina. Tamila, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. I was told that I, I could sit, do my talk uh, in a sitting pose, but I realized I would have to reach out too far <laughs> to flip. So if you don't mind, I will, I will stand and, and deliver it at the lectern, uh, so to speak. I wanted to start my talk with the beginning lines of this uh, review, the special issue that uh, Mick has just mentioned, which is an excellent issue, and which I dedicated to focusing not so much on the strategic aspects of the war, things like negotiation, military outcomes, possible scenarios. I wanted to focus on Russian society. And so I began my essay with the words, in May 2022, Ukraine held the first trial for war crimes in Russia's current war in Ukraine. The accused was Vadim Shushimarin, a 21-year-old Russian army sergeant charged with shooting and killing a 62-year-old unarmed Ukrainian civilian. In the media, all the, of the atten almost all of the attention was on the crime and its punishment. Did the soldier admit to committing the crime? Has he shown remorse? How long will his sentence be? But as a political scientist who has studied Russian society and Russia for over two decades, I saw the young soldier as, as the face of the society about which we know very little, hardly anything. So I, on my first slide, I decided to place this, this uh, uh, in blank image as the kind of representation of the Russian soldier that is an unknown. And I do so deliberately, because many of us, the, even those of us who have been seasoned observers of Russian politics for, for years, if not decades, find ourselves, found ourselves struggling to make sense of the extent of apparent support within Russia for this horrific war and aggression against Ukraine. We were struggling to make sense of the actual figures and percentages of individuals from various social groups who support the war and those who challenge it. Um, and uh, we didn't quite anticipate the extent to which there is a segment of society that is genuinely supportive and invested in this war. And I will come back to that. So this is something that even seasoned observers were not uh, quite anticipating. And I wanted to take us back to, take us to the question of knowledge production on the region. I'm in the International Relations Department, and I'm very much aware of how since the 2000s, since Putin came to power, there has been a kind of neo-Kremlinology, neo version of neo-Putinology, um, in that there is a renewed emphasis on kind of national politics and um, kind of big dynamics involving power holders, power, uh, in powerful players uh, in the Kremlin at the expense of a deep delve into Russian uh, society. And, um, and there are a variety of reasons for that. Some of those reasons I talk about in, in my essay, and I urge you 
uh, to read it to kind of understand the full extent of how many academic experts got Russian society wrong and a lot of us got uh, things wrong for a variety of reasons, methodological fads, paradigms, kind of paradigmatic um, sort of aspects of knowledge production on, on the region. And among these is also an elite, what I call an elite and urban bias. Even when we do study challenges to the Russian autocracy, to the Putin regime, we, follow, we, we, we focus on a very, very narrow slice of usually urban-based intelligentsia, people like Navalny, a lawyer, and a very, very small group of um, activists in the civil society, usually in the large cities of Moscow and St. Petersburg, perhaps a handful of individuals in, in capital uh, city. What we didn't so much focus on, and many of us do not understand, is the, the mass of Russian society, right? Behind these images of the handful of opposition activists, or indeed the man in the Kremlin, Putin, we really don't understand what makes Russian society ticks. We hardly ever venture into the provinces. So when I had this blank image of a soldier who represents the mass of Russian society, it is about this kind of aspect uh, of the unknown. And another aspect of knowledge production that kind of helps us to see where we got, got things wrong is that we haven't quite moved away from the communist paradigm. When we talk about how history shapes Russian present, at best we talk about communist legacies. We do not talk about centuries of Russian history that continue to influence the present. And that's what I write about in my book on the deeply entrenched social divides in Russian society that many of us uh, did not quite grasp or perceive adequately because we all bought into the communism as a brand new dawn, communism as a big break with the czarist society of the past. We all bought into that kind of paradigm, including many of my fellow political scientists who thought of the communist experiment as a big social break. Why is it important for us to perceive uh, this, this uh, kind of, uh, sure, and this is an example, by the way, of the vast number of books on, on Putin and the Kremlin. I recently was at Oxford for an alumni gathering. I popped into things called Blackwells, the famous uh, bookshop there, and there is a, a whole um, uh, bookcase, floor to ceiling, just books on Putin, right? How many more books on Putin do we need? <laughs> How, and, you know, please, please stop writing those books on Putin. We need to understand Russian society. And why do we need to understand Russian society? Because as I write in my book, communism never destroyed the deep social divides. What are those social divides? They are between an overwhelmingly illiterate at the time of the revolution, mass of peasant society which the Bolsheviks trapped in collective farms in a form of neo-serfdom, which had very limited prospects for social mobility. So that's the majority, and a very small minority of traditionally, habitually educated and internationally uh, exposed and traveled intelligentsia. At the time of the revolution, we are talking about a maximum of 20%. Nowadays, when you look at the percent of people who challenge Putin, actively participate in protests, we see that we have roughly the same figures, maybe about 20%. Um, and so when we try to understand support for the war or, or lack of challenge to the war, we have to understand the kind of social precarity in which the vast majority of Russians continue to live. But it's not just a precarity in the socioeconomic sense. It is also lack of exposure to information, uh, lack of access to education, including during the Soviet period, which kind of undermines the capacity to challenge the absolutely massive onslaught of propaganda that Russian society is living under now. We really cannot fathom the extent to which Russian society has been brainwashed by vile propagandistic narratives. Sadly, though, and, and so this is uh, an image to show that many of the conscripts 
uh, who are fighting in this war, and they are usually people, uh, like in many wars, from working class, poor, rural backgrounds, but not just that, they're also from ethnic minority communities, which are in turn also uh, living in very precarious conditions, often economically deprived. These are, this is an image that shows the distribution of conscripts, I believe, in proportion to the population. Some regions like Buryatia, uh, overwhelmingly uh, overrepresented in, in, in the share of conscripts, whereas you find cities like Moscow, St. Petersburg underrepresented, not so much because they're actively challenging the war, but because they have the money to buy their children out of conscription. So we have these social economic divides, but what is sad, and this is something that is increasingly becoming evident to me and all the other educated Russians, um, that this kind of support or passive complicity with the war is not just limited to those precarious um, marginalized communities. It has infested the educated society of Russia as well. I know that because I have relatives in Russia. I have relatives in the Crimea, Russian speakers. I have friends from my high school in Moscow. And I can absolutely see that it has become futile to argue and to try to convince and persuade these people. The power of propaganda is absolutely, um, is, is, is just something that we, we cannot quite fathom. It is there. And so I invite us to think, maybe we will do in the uh, Q&A session, about where does that, does, does, the, does that place Russia after the war? Because we have to think about the mass of Russian society that he has been complicit, if not with the actual crimes, war crimes, but with actual, in the sense of being passive or having sanitized their, their lives out of um, considerations of the war. And these two are images that my relatives have sent me. This is summer in Moscow. It's not just even that life goes on as usual. Life has become better. And not just for people in urban cities like Moscow, these uh, Moscow images, but in rural towns as well. I was recently at a talk uh, by a very well-known Russian regional specialist, and I thought he was somewhat facetious, facetious was speaking in London, when he said that Russian society has become richer because of the war. And I really could not... Um, think that he could be serious or any that his arguments are underpinned by any serious kind of evidence. I'm seeing more and more evidence that what he said was absolutely true. What he was saying is that the war money, whether in the form of some kind of subsidy that the family of the diseased gets or other perks if the, if the soldier has been wounded and then they come back and get some perks, this has really helped develop the economies of the regions in which these poor, um, in, in these deprived communities. Um, and, and that is the real paradox of the war. And on the other hand, you have these prosperous cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg, where life goes on as usual. I won't take us as far as, you know, grim images, perhaps from, you know, uh, parallels with um, other, you know, wartime contexts. Perhaps Germany in the 1940s, uh, you know, it's just a very, psychologically, it's very, very hard to understand for people like me who are constantly on social media, who are following, uh, you know, the passionate kind of discussions among Ukrainians, people, uh, other people in the countries that are concerned about this war, about casualties, all of us trying to do something, anything, whether we bring Ukrainian scholars here to LIC and help them, and we have uh, some outstanding scholars here, or individually within our families, we welcome Ukrainians. What we see within Russia is <coughs> that less of that kind of, perhaps, involvement and, and compassion that one would have expected to see. So perhaps I should wrap up by saying that um, in discussing, you know, where, 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 what the future might hold, even when, and I'm not saying if Ukraine wins, it's when, it's just a matter of time, we should think about Russia, whose population has been in many ways complicit 
even if it's in a very passive way. Uh, so I leave it uh, on that and, and uh, pass on to the next speaker. Thank you. All, all the other speakers will speak from the from the desk here. We move straight over to Dr. Eleanor. Not Eleanor, over to you. Great, thank you. This mic, the mic is on, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Can you hear at the top there? Can yeah. you hear okay at the top? <laughs> perfect. Okay. Reassure, um, reassure me, please. Thank you. Thank you. I think one way or another, I'm going to end up in quite a similar vein um, to Tamila, but I'm going to start in a slightly different place. Um, so I want to start with a quote. Uh, from the International Summit for Crimea Platform, which was held in Kyiv uh, in this August, on the 23rd of August, um, which is the day before Ukraine's Independence Day. Um, the quote that I'm going to talk about in a second is from Louis Amalgro, who is the Secretary General of the Organization of American States. And he says that the full-scale invasion of Ukraine was launched on February 24, 2022. But it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge that the violation of Ukraine's territorial integrity started with the unlawful occupation an annexation of Crimea that dates back to 2014. It is a fact we simply cannot forget. Um, 2014 will be 10 years ago next February, uh, and that will be three years uh, since the full-scale invasion. Um, but I just wanted to kind of contextualize that while we talk about the war in the present tense, the violation of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity has a longer history that dates back to 2014, if not slightly before. So this was the third international summit of Crimea platform, which was held first in 2021, with uh, Russia's full-scale invasion occurring just seven months later. And Crimea platform, at least from my perspective, was very much uh, established following work by advocacy work from Crimean uh, civil society, including Crimean Tatars and Crimean uh, Tatar civil society. They really lobbied the Ukrainian government and President Zelensky to support the initiative and to create a forum to continue to remind the international community of Russia's annexation of Crimea. At the same time, members of Crimean Tatar civil society have themselves been persecuted for their participation in this forum. Uh, Naraman Jalal, a journalist, was, uh, has been illegally held by Russian authorities since his participation in the Crimea Platform Forum in 2021. And I use this to kind of set the context as to where we are now. Because the scale and scope and nature of Russia's atrocities and violence in Ukraine is really kind of hard to both fathom and really to put into words because it is so humongous. A minimum of 16,000 Ukrainian civilians have lost their lives, a minimum of 70,000 Ukrainian troops have been killed, and a further minimum of 120,000 Ukrainian troops have been wounded. Russia has been committing genocide, ecocide, destroying farmland, killing many millions of animals. Um, it has destroyed the Kokova Dam. It has used rape and torture as weapons of war. It has committed war crimes. And by pulling out of the Black Sea, Black sea grain deal, it has also used food as a weapon of war. And given that we're at a university, I also wanted to comment on Russia's, uh, one dimension of Russia's cultural destu destruction, which is that Russia has destroyed 200 libraries. It's damaged a further 400 libraries and altogether has destroyed 180 million books. When I read that statistic, I couldn't quite believe that we're talking about 180 million books. The point of this long introduction and these figures is just to demonstrate the kind of human cost, extent, and length of Russia's conflict, now war in Ukraine, its magnitude and the human cost. The argument that I want to focus on today is how Russia approaches Ukraine in existential and non-consensual ways. Ukraine is fighting for its existence fighting for its right to be a sovereign state, while, Ukraine is, uh, while Russia is fighting for a non-consensual version of Ukrainian existence, where Russia has veto power. And so my argument is that this is, uh, Russia's kind of motivation is really about existential nationalism, to pursue this war, whatever the costs, and in many ways to deny that those are costs at all. And Ukraine's motivation is to fight with everything that it has and for everything that it wants, which is the right to sovereignty, territorial integrity, and to govern the entire territory of Ukraine without Russian troops uh, being present. Russia treats Ukraine as a state permanently tethered to its idea of what it should be, as if Ukraine is a state incapable of governing itself, interpreting its own history, forming its own foreign policy, and deciding if it is a state overrun by Nazis or determining who Nazis are in the first place. And specifically in the remainder of my time, I want to look at um, three groups that have been securitized by Russian nationalism. 
or kind of constructed as an other, as a threat by Russian nationalism. And each group has experienced varying degrees and forms of repression and violence. My point is not to compare them, but to kind of demonstrate the kind of breadth of the securitization, which is extended to war and genocide in Ukraine, where repression and violence is legitimized through this increasingly securitized rhetoric towards these kind of what I would describe as others of Russian nationalism. And I'm going to focus on three, but I also want to put out there that these are not the only groups that are being securitized by Russian nationalism. So first are what I describe as Russia's increasingly internal others that reside within the Russian Federation, and these are non-Russian uh, minorities, Muslim uh, minorities in particular. So Muslim minorities in Russia have been disproportionately targeted by Russian draft notices to fight in Ukraine. And this disproportionality is very much a potentially just like deliberate strategy um, as a continuation of repression and a use of repression during wartime. It represents an extended instrument of control, denying agency and implicating society at large in war efforts, with the goal of legitimizing the Putin regime via this form of repression. Second are the securitized others in between, Crimean Tatars. Crimean Tatars are a largely secular and pacifist Muslim minority that reside in the indig their indigenous homeland of Crimea. Crimean Tatars are what I describe as securitized others in between. They exist in territory illegally annexed by Russia in 2014, but they functionally reside in territory that has been annexed de facto by Russia since 2014, that is de jure Ukrainian. And many now live in exile in mainland Ukraine due to repression. The securitization of Crimean Tatars um, has a long history. So it's not only the Putin regime that has securitized Crimean Tatars. Uh, in 1944, the Stalin regime uh, brutally deported Crimean Tatars to Siberia. Uh, many died en route due to this deportation or died in exile due to the horrendous conditions they were forced to live under. And it wasn't until the 1980s that Crimean Tatars were allowed to return to their indigenous homeland of Crimea. Living conditions slowly improved. There were many unanswered questions, but it was really annexation that um, created a juncture in Crimean Tatars' experience of life with the Russian regime uh, brutally beginning to target them once again. Crimean Tatar organizations have been banned. They've been labeled as extremist. Crimean Tatars have been arrested, censored, tortured, kidnapped, subject to extra, extra legal prosecutions, and murdered. And all of this has been done under the, the kind of veil of um, protecting Russia from anti-extremism and counter-terrorism. And I would just remind you again that Crimean Tatars follow norms of secularism and pacifism. So the idea that they could be extremist could not be further from the truth. Crimean Tatars themselves also face disproportional draft notices, and as commented on by Crimean Tatar community leaders, this is extremely sinister because they're being uh, forced to fight in a war against their state of Ukraine. So Russia is able to pursue what they describe as kind of getting rid of undesirable people in Crimea and Russia. And kind of the, the lens of settler colonial uh, nationalism has also been a also been appropriated to kind of describe what is going on. Because the Russian regime seeks to erase Crimean Tatar claims to ind indigeneity and remove the physical and human evidence of them uh, from Crimea as kind of a predecessor population. Instead, the Russian regime seeks to reframe ethnic Russian settlers, including those who moved to Crimea after annexation, as the historic population of Crimea, which again could not be further from the truth. The third group of securitized others that I want to focus on is Ukraine and its citizens. Russia either seeks to control Ukraine or other Ukraine. And this contradiction is best explained by Russia's non-consensual vision for Ukraine um, that I've already kind of uh, described, where Russia almost existentially requires Ukraine to be an empire, to be, to, sorry, where Russia existentially requires Ukraine to be within its empire as a subordinate member of that empire. So control over Ukraine and its uh, subservience to Russia are themselves kind of an existential imperative for Russia. It cannot imagine a world or does not want to imagine a world where it is not mandating Ukraine to be subservient to it. And I would describe this othering as kind of classic victim blaming. As Ukraine seeks to express its right to dis disentangle itself from these legacies, from a non-consensual and imperial relationship of subordination, that is exactly the moment at which Russia is targeting Ukraine through war. What Russia fears less is Ukrainian nationalism and Ukrainian nationalists and more Russian speakers like Zelensky who offer a plural, multicultural, multi-ethnic, Europeanized and democratic vision for Ukraine. 
Russian speakers in Ukraine can now clearly communicate a vision for these ideals within Ukraine, but they also pose a risk in Putin's eyes for the Russian state by threatening to offer a different vision for how Ukraine can interact with Russia and how Russian citizens themselves can interact with the Russian state. So the nature of oppression differs between these three others of Russian nationalism, but what ties them together is how Russia views them all as a risk. So my point is not comparison, but kind of juxtaposition. And securitized, securitization of these others is a kind of strategic function of a regime that seeks to kind of legitimize itself and continue in, in perpetuity its kind of vision of the world. But ironically, Russia's actions are consolidating precisely the opposite of what it seeks to. Because since 2014, Russia's conflict against Ukraine has consolidated this vision of, of Ukraine as entirely separable from Russia, and the values that Russia has is entirely antithetical. And the path that Russia has chosen since 2022 has only further shorn up these processes. So I want to remark on, like, what are the policy implications of this? Like, why should we care that Russia has a, a neo-colonial, non-consensual approach to Ukraine? Why does it matter? I think it matters because of the ways that Western actors can find themselves speaking about the war. As if Ukrainian victory is important, but Russian loss is kind of uncomfortable. We can't really kind of sit with the uncomfortableness of what that means. And we support Ukraine, but we want security guarantees for Russia. That is basically what Macron has said in the last year. That in order for peace, that Russia can't lose too much. But the security guarantees that Russia wants are a claim to another state's territorial integrity and sovereignty. And I would argue that in... in suggesting that Russia has a right to security guarantees, we're listening to the antagonist of a conflict, the um, perpetrator of war crimes, the perpetrator of genocide, and not the victim. Russia's war would be over tomorrow if it withdrew all its troops and if it abandoned its non-consensual approach to Ukraine. So not only is the problem military, we also have to kind of recognize the problem as ideological in the sense of Russia's claims to Ukraine are existential, they're securitizing, and that's also what needs challenging because there will be no lasting peace without a requirement for Russia to kind of recognize that it has to have a fundamentally different relationship with Ukraine going forward. And I also think that a part of this endeavor is listening to Ukrainians, understanding what peace is from their perspective and not abandoning uh, their voices, their rights, their claims. Um, at the point in which um, we move forward. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anna. That's great. <laughs> so we uh, move from Russia, Ukraine, Ukraine and Russia. We now move, in a sense, to the international. The two things are not separate. There's no Chinese war between them, but I'm going to ask uh, my old friend Chris Alden to reflect beyond, beyond the immediate conflict and how this conflict is being seen, perceived, understood, viewed, uh, with political consequences too, Chris, in, in the global south and how, how this is working out globally. So, Chris, over to you. Thanks very much. <clears throat> yes, indeed. I think in the immediate aftermath of the Russian invasion, there was a, an expectation that uh, on the part of Western governments, perhaps yourselves as well, that we would see a unified position, an invasion of sovereignty, clear, unambiguous uh, uh, in, in its, uh, as such. And in fact, there were a few signs in that first UN Security Council meeting. We saw the Kenyan representative, a non-permanent uh, representative, speak about a colonial-like uh, invasion. So there was that utterance. But actually, when it came to votes, uh, voting in the, in the General Assembly, we saw a consistent group of about 40 states that would either abstain or, or in fact, uh, uh, vote against referenda that were condemning Russian invasions or, or violations of territory, sovereignty, and the like. And that was something that was unexpected, unexpected at the scale and the consistency um, in April 2022, despite clear evidence of human rights violations, systematic human rights violations, 50 members of the, uh, of, of the General Assembly voted against uh, expelling a resolution calling for Russia to be expelled from the Human Rights Council. So again, we see a core number of 
members of, of in fact, mostly, but not, uh, not exclusively, from Africa, Latin America, Asia, or the Middle East. In other words, what people like to call the global south. Okay. Taking a position of, of abstaining, not, not putting their, name, their, their country's name forward uh, in, in criticizing a, or condemning uh, the Russian invasion. So the question is, first, who, who these countries are? What does it mean, the global south? It's a, an old term, but its common use is, is more evident today than in any other time. Um, and why did they take a position such as this around such a clear-cut violation of sovereignty, a position which all these countries at various times have, have uh, said are, are paramount foreign policy goals of there to, to protect sovereignty one way or the other. Okay, so first the, the Global South, very quickly, countries that share a history, a common history, colonialism, imperialism, and the like, decolonized states in the main. Uh, they also share imperatives for, of nation building, right, in the aftermath of, of gaining independence. The necessity of nation building, protection of sovereignty being one element of that, and, de and development, finding a route out of where they, their colonial past uh, to, to a full developed condition and state. They, the United Nations is a place where they could fulfill some portion of these ambitions. The coalition politics that come into play within the UN encouraged uh, countries from these different regions who really didn't necessarily know each other, familiar with each other, they discovered themselves in this setting. And in that context, they began to form the, the, the Africa group, the, the, the Arab states group. And, and in that context, they began to find that common cause was the basis for action in this liberal institution, right, with the values uh, uh, articulated in the UN Charter. Um, so in some sense, the Global South uh, exists in New York, in the United Nations, most strongly and evidently, right? More so than you would see necessarily in regional politics across the globe, but it's not excluded from that. And why, so, so if that's the definition, what, why did they vote the way they did in, at the United Nations? I think if you analyze the arguments, they come down to three different ones in particular. First, and most frequently cited, exasperation with Western hypocrisy, right? The word hypocrisy sort of rings out across many of the statements made to uh, support or, or justify uh, their position. Sovereignty has been violated by Western governments in the 21st century. They draw a clear line of continuity. Great power politics, permanent five members, Russia, US, UK, you name it. Play this game, the French played this game. The Chinese come out a little bit better in this one. Uh, but uh, as portrayed in, the, in this um, uh, dialogue. Um, <clears throat> so exasperation with that which spills later into a general uh, malaise towards the UN Security Council, an unreformed Security Council, a council which reflects power dynamics of 1945 more readily than it does of our present day. The um, second uh, source of, of their voting conduct was neglect uh, and, and the damage done by the war to global development, uh, um, the, to the global development agenda, um, captured in the, the development goals um, and, and the like. Um, and often people would say, we are hurting from economic sanctions. We are experiencing the pain. The, the, the weaponization of the dollar has made it difficult for our businesses to, to transact business as before with partners and banks we didn't even know had connections to the Russians, right? I was in uh, last year in September in Quito and uh, was taken uh, on the weekend down to the valley below the, the city and was pointed out to me, they said, the flower farms you see here, principal uh, uh, economic partner, was well, their sales went to Russia, 
we can't do that anymore. We're no longer in a position because of sanctions. So for, for, from the perspective of the Global South countries, the European war, what is a European war and is far away, a statement that was so often made when conflict came to those regions, right, is one which, uh, uh, and, and is accompanied by sanctions, energy price rise, food price scarcity and, and difficulty. You all know uh, about getting grain out of Ukraine, Russia, and the like. And for them, it's, it's a complete, it's, it has to come to an end. That's the position. It's about their economy, the development aspirations, and the like. Um, a third is the escalation. It, it has been the Global South position, if you look back uh, to, the, to the earlier era, in the Cold War era, has, ha, they'd taken a traditionally strong uh, position on disarmament, nuclear disarmament in particular. And the, the, the conduct of the war, albeit the blame putting, being placed on Putin's actions to escalate to the level of nuclear uh, conflict, nonetheless has stirred some of that old debate, saying what is going on here? We're, we're in a war, uh, wh whoever started it, it has to stop. It has to stop without a nuclear end to it. So that has also featured in the discussions and impacts uh, and uh, positions. But I think it's more than just those arguments. I think what it's also done is it's inspired a new debate across the global south, which is to say, what is it to be non-aligned in, in a world that is not a, is a post-Cold War world, but it's also a world that is moving towards apparent multipolarity. So the kind of default position of, of foreign policies of global south countries has been to sort of situate themselves between other countries and say, we're, we're not going to take positions, take sides and what have you. The pressure that's been placed on them on all sides, right? From, from uh, the Russian side, from other, from uh, Western side, uh, has meant that, or the pressures experienced by shortages, economic shortages or what have you that, that hurt their own constituencies have also produced that. And it's generated a debate about this what does, what is the position, how is it uh, of, of these countries, how is it to be, how can you be non-aligned? In the, in the post-Cold War era, strategic autonomy was sort of the watchword. Let's find more space to operate. Let's, let's take decisions which, uh, alignments and what have you, that give us more likelihood of, uh, of pursuing our interests more readily across the board. In the multipolar world that is emerging, or so, as the, so they see it, um, the particularly influential is Jorge Hain and Carlos Omenani, uh, and they talk about active non-alignment. They say that, in fact, a kind of transactional foreign policy should be pursued, where there's no ideology at play here. There's no affinities. You cut the deal specific to the issue of the day. So that, that certainly got a lot of... Uh, uh, discussion in, in countries in the global south, uh, in countries that are affiliating themselves uh, increase or see themselves to be torn between uh, affiliations from one side or the other. And then finally, the last uh, uh, longer term impact of this has been to renew the call for reform of multilateral institutions. Multilateral institutions are not functioning. Certainly the Security Council is not doing its job. When the permanent five, members of the permanent five are out there uh, invading countries uh, or, or supplying weapons or however they would, they would uh, uh, describe it. In all senses, they would see this as not doing what it's supposed to do, be keepers of the peace, okay? So the General Assembly again passed a resolution uh, uh, last year. Uh, calling for the UN Security of Permanent Five to justify at every occasion why they use the veto. What was it? How did it fit the charter? How did they fulfill their mandate by, by uh, uh, issuing a veto? A second part, uh, if, if the UN Security 
The, the multilateral security system is, is under question. So too is the, the, the dominance of, of the dollar, the U.S. dollar. Uh, the weaponization of the dollar has made, um, uh, has, has of course uh, caused some of the economic disruption, the difficulties the, 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 that uh, I described earlier, and a debate and discussion about is there a way to, in, uh, to insulate ourselves from this uh, uh, and can we de-dollarize in some way, re reduce our exposure? Finally, it's uh, been reflected, all of this has been reflected in the uh, upsurge of interest in uh, the, the self-styled counter-alliance, counter as it were, the Russian-Chinese uh, body that grew into uh, the form of BRICS, right? Brazil, Russia, uh, India, um, uh, China and South Africa, and uh, the, the expansion of membership. Over 40 countries put in applications to become BRICS members. They wanted to hedge their bets. They, they also, in some cases, saw this as a sign of uh, non-alignment uh, w with another aligned uh, party in the emerging order. So all of this has shaken the foundation of what the Global South understood itself to be and how it sees itself building a future. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, thanks, Chris. That's great. <laughs> and uh, we now move on to the last presentation, uh, formal presentation, uh, from Robert Faulkner on energy environment. Over to you, Robert. Mick, thank you so much. Mick, thanks for organizing this wonderful event. Uh, very timely indeed to focus on these issues. So I'm going to shift focus, as Mick said, I'm going to look at energy and climate policy. And I want to start with the simple question of asking how Europe responded to the weaponization of energy by Russia in 22, and what impact that had on climate change and climate policy around the world. Um, in the beginning, straight after the invasion, a lot of people looked at the energy and climate situation and, and reckoned this is this can only mean bad news, right? Europe was heavily exposed to Russian energy imports, uh, needed those gas flows desperately to keep its economy going, and the war was only going to slow down progress on climate uh, targets. So the initial fear was quite strong that this would not only have a devastating impact on Ukraine and, and the people under occupation, but also on the wider energy and climate policy scenario. And if you think back to February 2022 and be before, it is indeed quite astonishing to realize just how deep the energy shock was that Europe experienced due to the invasion. This was the biggest energy shock since the <coughs> 1970s oil crisis. But of course, it was also, it laid bare the deep strategic blunder in the, in the heart of Europe's foreign policy in terms of having allowed Europe to become so dependent on Russian energy for all these years leading up to February 22. Just to give you one figure, in early 22, 90% of Europe's gas that was consumed within Europe had to be imported. Of those imports, 45% came from Russia. It's an astonishing figure. To, to imagine that you would allow yourself to be so dependent on one key supplier. In fact, the European Union had several opportunities to rethink that relationship. Some of them were mentioned before. It wasn't the first time that Russia caused trouble in the relationship with Ukraine. In 2008, 2009, there were various disputes where Ukraine and Russia argued over the payments for gas deliveries through Ukraine's territory, and that already indicated Russia's willingness to weaponize energy to such an extent. How did Europe respond? Well, the EU, and particularly Germany, said we need another supply line to Russia, Nord Stream 2, instead of weaning ourselves off. Then came 2014, Russia's invasion of Crimea and its, its undermining of, of uh, the various eastern regions. How did Europe respond? In 2015, the year after the invasion, Russian gas uh, made up 36% of European consumption. By 2018, that had shot up to 41%. So rather than disengaging from the stranglehold that Russia had developed, 
Europe let Russia become even stronger in that energy relationship. And, of course, at the center of all that is Germany. The, I should perhaps mention I'm originally from Germany, so I can speak freely about that. That country that clearly seemed to really think it would understand Putin and, and, and would understand Russia and would be able to mediate between Russia and the West. Germany pressed ahead with Nord Stream 2. It had even allowed Gazprom, the Russian uh, gas company, to buy up the gas storage facilities in the country, which it then had to nationalize at some speed. Gazprom was running down the reserves of gas in these facilities before February 22. So many, many missed opportunities and signals that weren't taken seriously. So given that, I think it's fair to say, as many observers did at the time, that, uh, that Russia really held uh, uh, Europe uh, in, a, in a state of dependency and that Europe would struggle to get out of this. So what happened? It's interesting to note just how quickly things shifted in the aftermath of the invasion. Because within a year, Russian oil and coal imports to the European Union had more or less uh, stopped. There's virtually no uh, direct imports coming from uh, Russia in terms of oil and coal. We still consume some Russian gas. That's proving more difficult to uh, slow down and, 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 and switch off. Uh, gas infrastructure, as everyone knows, is difficult to replace quickly, although Germany uh, managed to open LNG terminals in record time, six of them operational already and now. Um, but in the end, even Russian gas flows are now down so significantly that Russia no longer can claim to be strangling uh, Europe in, in that regard. It's a combination of a number of factors that Russia, uh, that the European Union adopted that made this possible. Some form of supply diversification, some form of demand reduction, and perhaps, arguably, a warm winter last winter, 22, 23, that all helped. But within six months after the invasion, the European Union set itself a target of reducing gas consumption by 15%. And by January this year, the gas consumption in Europe, across Europe had been reduced by 19.3%. The target was overshot. Um, it came at some economic cost, undoubtedly. But so far, the situation looks relatively stable. Uh, some sectors, ceramics, chemicals that depend heavily on gas, uh, struggled and they saw a decline in economic activity. But the initial fears were not borne out. If you again go to Germany, which was of course at the heart of that debate, uh, some of the, the doomsday uh, scenarios that were developed in German economic circles initially uh, said that we would face a, a reduction of GDP between 6 and 12 percent in Germany due to the energy struggle uh, that was going on between the EU and, 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 and Russia at the time. Three million additional unemployed people were supposed to be on the streets. In reality, German GDP rose by 2% last year. And although um, uh, it has now entered a mini recession in, in the winter of 22-23, it's still managing to avoid a deep downturn in its economic scenario. The reason, of course, is that gas consumption was reduced, supplies were uh, secured from outside the EU, and most importantly, a concerted effort was made to reduce dependence on, on, on gas, particularly in those sectors that had alternatives. But if you compare that response across Europe compared to its initial hesitancy when it came to military support, then that is indeed a, a dramatic turnaround of events, and it worked wonders. So let me now switch to the climate area. Because here the, the fear was that the European Union would struggle to keep up the momentum in terms of switching off fossil fuels and, and, and moving over to renewables. Because the first imperative, of course, was, and who would deny that imperative, to wean Europe off Russian energy imports. Uh, the EU scrambled together alternative supply uh, lines. Deals were struck with the United States, with Qatar, with, with various North African countries. LNG terminals were opened. Coal was imported from North America again. And there was an initial fear that this would deeply, deeply 
set back uh, the EU's climate targets. But again, we need to look very carefully at, at the situation, and it turns out that, uh, according to the IEA's estimates last year, the EU's energy-related emissions, so not all emissions, but those related to energy consumptions, actually fell by 2.5%. So, if anything, the response that the European Union mustered up in that area helped to accelerate the, to the switch off of fossil fuels. Coal was initially imported, and there were plenty of gleeful commentators saying, there you go again, when, when, when it gets tough, uh, coal becomes the kind of fallback option. Of course, there's an easily available supply of coal, but that didn't uh, happen. The initial coal consumption that drove up emissions was more than counteracted by the gas reduction in Europe, and it became possible to bring those energy-related emissions down. So I think it's fair to say that, if anything, the war accelerated European efforts to decarbonize the economy. Uh, the European Union drove up investments in renewable energy. It accelerated the investment package that came with the Green Deal. And what's more, it finally managed to reform the EU emissions trading system to drive up the carbon price across Europe, which shot, over, shot up to over 100 euros per tonne of CO2. So the initial fears were completely confounded and, and the EU managed to stay on track. So the argument, therefore, has to be, and I'm looking forward to your reaction, that, that the initial impetus of the war, the fear that this would derail our energy independence strategy, and would scupper climate goals, clearly was not borne out. In fact, there was no trade-off between energy independence and climate policy. Uh, you hear this a lot in this country in recent days and weeks, uh, particularly in Manchester, that if you want to secure your energy future against a dominant Russia, a hostile China, you need to drill for oil in your own territory. Turns out you don't have to. It turns out you can reduce consumption and find alternative investments. If anything, the war has galvanized European leaders to reaffirm their commitment to the net zero targets and to accelerate that process. It is driving down reliance on fossil fuels, and it is helping in, in that sense to accelerate the net zero transition. Okay, now before you accuse me of... of of extremely uh, optimistic uh, uh, tendencies here, uh, we should perhaps broaden the focus. I've focused on Europe so far, but what about the wider global context? Because there the picture isn't quite so rosy. And that also goes a little bit back to what Chris was saying about the Global South's response. First of all, it's worth noting that Russia may have lost European markets, but it has gained new global markets, particularly for its oil. It's just been reported by the Financial Times a couple of days ago that about three quarters of all seaborne Russian crude flows traveled without the ships that Western insurance companies had insured, and that gave us a lever against Russia in terms of uh, limiting its export markets. Three quarters of Russian oil is now floating on the world's oceans in the so-called dark fleet that Russia has assembled. And of course, it could not have done that on its own. There were plenty of willing collaborators that helped that uh, business. It's now estimated that the country's oil revenues are likely to shoot up by $15 billion for 2023. So far from seeing a reduction in its war chest, it is being, mm. that war chest is being replenished, and there are plenty of collaborators around the world. Uh, I've spoken to a shipping expert recently who confirmed that uh, Russian oil is pumped from one ship on to the other on the high seas. Russian oil that's refined in India or in, or in other places can be re-exported and uh, acquires a different national characteristic. <laughs> and there are all sorts of loopholes that we have been unable to close. And that's where it really hurts that the West was unable to build that broader coalition around the world to close down the, the oil and gas and coal markets for Russia. Mm. But secondly, and I'll finish on that, mm -hmm. is that there were plenty of willing takers for Russian energy exports. China is building new pipelines for gas. India was very happy to absorb much bigger oil imports. Many other countries have done so ha happily. So we're seeing while Europe is continuing to drive down fossil fuel reliance, 
We're seeing a carbon lock-in in many other countries' energy systems, helped by the Ukraine war. I would not worry so much about China, because China is pursuing its renewable energy strategy at pace, irrespective of that. But many other countries that are more lukewarm about the decarbonisation targets, India in particular, but many other developing countries, they are now looking at a trade-off between those two. And I think Russian energy is helping them to slow down that process. There are other domestic political pressures that we're experiencing in the climate field, but most critically, perhaps, it's the breakdown of multilateral cooperation that's likely to spill over into international climate policy. At the moment, we're looking for a host for the, the COP meeting after the next one, and that's meant to be in Eastern Europe, but there is a standoff, and Russia is not helping to uh, fix that standoff. So there is a fear that there will be a kind of collateral damage to climate cooperation in the broader round. Mm. So Europe clearly has a, a role to play in showing the way towards uh, an effective energy and climate response, but that just won't be enough. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. So we, we, we have about, uh, well, we have exactly about 30, 25 minutes for conversation. Uh, Tamila uh, began on getting Russia wrong. Uh, Elena continued to talk about the unintended consequences of Russian action, actually almost forging Ukraine uh, or reinforcing Ukraine. Uh, Chris talked about why the Global South used the conflict differently and gave her some detailed reasons. And, and Robert, I thought, was veering into terrible optimism for one moment there. Uh, but, but he saved himself at the end there. Well done, Robert. Uh, but certainly the dangers of dependence, but also what you brought out too was the the very different ways in which energy and the question of climate change is going to affect. But I think the point at the very end is also extremely important. You know, there is no international cooperation now between the members of the United Nations P5. I mean, there are loggerheads on nearly everything. And if there are loggerheads on the war or loggerheads about the shape of the new world order to come, then cooperation on larger issues and other issues including climate change and including a lot of other things like nuclear proliferation are very much uh, off the agenda and there it may lie some of the larger international and global consequences of the war. I just want to pose two general questions, one to Tamala and to Eleanor and then one to Chris and, and, and Robert. But for Tamala and, or Tamala and Eleanor, you've spoken a lot in very realistic and some would say deeply pessimistic but realistic terms about where we are now, and as I said at the very beginning, uh, where we are now may not be where we are in six months' time. It could even get worse. Uh, you talked a lot about the war. Could you give us some reflection briefly? I know this is an impossible question to answer. Are there any dynamics towards peace? <laughs> uh, some negotiation uh, between either Ukraine or Russia or Ukraine and Russia. I know earlier this year China put forward a 12-part peace plan in February of this year, Wang Yi, the foreign minister then, uh, but I'd be interested to get your thoughts on that because the analysis you provided, it seemed to me, um, well, it won't cheer John Lennon up because giving peace a chance ain't going to happen anytime soon, is it? So I'd just like to get your reflections on the dynamics of this because we always talk about the international actors. But you both quite rightly talked about the domestic forces. And it seems to me from your analysis, if I'm not misreading you, that the possibility of any negotiation between the two, two the principal actors on the ground, or two of them, is very, very limited. So I'd like to get your reflections on that from your analysis. And for Chris and for Robert, you know, in international relations, we, we love moments, don't we? We like great transitional points. We like the end of the Cold War, it redefined the end of the world. It changed the world forever. Wars redefine orders. The First World War, the Second World War, the end of the Cold War, the Cold War itself. So wars have been massive in shaping, redefining world politics, maybe even more so than pure economics, if you like. I don't know. Do you think this is a defining moment in international relations, moving beyond just the global south, is this a kind of transitional moment we're going to look back 
in, in you know, 10, 15, 20 years' time say, that is crucial. That's our 1991 moment. That's our end of World War II moment. That's our 1914 moment. Whatever moment you want. I'd just like to get your broader reflections on that. So I'll, I'll open with those two broad questions, a few reflections from our four speakers. Then I'll take it to the floor and also to people online because there's a lot of people asking questions. So, Tomala, do you want to begin at the sure. very end there, please? Yeah, um, any if, sort of move towards peace or any reflections on peace? If you I get think, closer to the mic, I think, oh, Tomala, do you mind? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I or is that your mic in front of you, I think, would be oh, fine. Yes, it yeah, that's is. fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, do I need to switch it on? I think, can you hear me better? Oh, no. So stand up then, okay. No, I think, uh, no, is, there is a mic. Just this is LSE technology at its very best. Oh. <laughs> We have this. We have this all the time, but yeah, why not stand up? Yeah, stand, stand up. Yeah. up and, uh, stand up, up and be counted, okay, as they that, say. Yeah. Use sense. the mic over there. Tom. Um, unfortunately, any kind of peace uh, that would be acceptable for Russia, or so-called peace, I should say, would never be acceptable to Ukraine, because peace for Russia would mean keeping some of the territories that have been annexed in violation of international law. And the so-called peace uh, Russian style would also be unacceptable for a lot of the reasons that Eleanor discussed, mm -hmm. namely, that, and, and, and also uh, there is a, uh, one scholar uh, of Russia has used the word naive pacifism. <laughs> so naive pacifism is to assume that there will be peace even if Russia keeps some of the territories within those lands that Russia had annexed. Well, what we will see and this is what I wrote uh, several years ago when Russia annexed Crimea. I published a blog post on, in the monkey cage called, will, uh, will Crimea be worse off under Russian rule? <laughs> and I would answer that in the affirmative. Because what we will see is democracy will be undermined. There will be tortures. There will be disappearances. You know, ethnic Tatar activists would be jailed, would continue to stay in jail, or would disappear if Crimea were to retain uh, uh, remain within Russia. So uh, you would have all these kind of violations of human rights uh, and basic kind of democratic freedoms that we see within Russia. So is that the peace, the kind of peace that the international community would want? And this is the question we should we should ask. So I'll, I'll pass on to Eleanor. Thanks very much, Eleanor. For a different take. Um, yeah, no, I completely agree. And thank you for very much kind of saying what I would also say. I mean, I, th I would just add two dimensions to that, which is that currently I think the main route to peace is the Ukrainian counteroffensive, um, which will be long and costly in terms of lives and require ongoing supplies of weapons. And the second is a little bit less obvious. I mean, I was reading an article over the summer about the kind of vigilante groups that exist within the Russian army that are destroying weapons. Um, so Crimean Tatars would be the kind of the, the, I'm not saying these movements are large, but I'm saying that they exist within the Russian army and Crimean Tatars are within them. And the kind of discourse is that as the counteroffensive is more successful, those groups will enlarge it. So I think that's a really interesting idea to think that okay, there are many people conscripted into the Russian army, but not all of those are necessarily complicit. I mean, a large percentage are, but there are people who are engaging in extremely brave um, actions within the Russian army to destroy weapons um, as well. Okay. Let's get on to that broader question then to Chris and to uh, Robert. Is this a defining moment in the world system as, as important as some other defining moments in the world order? Chris, what do you think? Um, <clears throat> first, I think that's a historian's trick you're playing on it. It's, well, I am. But, you know, uh, I'm a tricky historian. Uh, yes, indeed. Yeah, but um, I think the moment, if this was a moment, <laughs> how I would characterize it is 19, more 1936. Uh, and it's one that, it's, this is Spain, if you like, oh, okay. where the, panto the kind of brutal pantomime of the world to come was played out. Uh, and uh, whether it heads in that other direction yeah. of something bigger, you know, we'll know in in, uh, in the you know months and perhaps years to come, but but uh, less less the turning point, but the turning point before the turning point, shall we say? Okay, well that's pretty pessimistic. Ominous, yes. Ominous, even yes. Look what happened in 1939, 41. <laughs> I think the answer to the question for me is it, it depends on where you sit in the world. Um, I think that tells us something about how the world has yeah. changed. 
So if you're in, the, in Central Europe, Poland, uh, yeah. Czech Republic, even Germany, Zeitenwende, right? This is the big turning point, biggest military confrontation since the Second World War. This surely has to be the, the big turning point. Uh, the security structure has been changed and will have to change. But if you sit somewhere else in the world, it's just one more conflict that is an annoyance, but certainly not the most important, right? How, how do Iraqis feel about it? Afghans, what about people in Rwanda? What was their turning point? Uh, and what did the world do after 1994 about eradicating genocide? So I, I think it's, it'll be indicative that we will all think differently about the significance of this war. And this already tells us something about the sort of disintegrating world order and then the, the, the pulling apart, the pluralization of worldviews that, that we are witnessing. And much of this is also going to depend not just on what's happening on the ground, but also what happens in the U.S. elections <laughs> next year, in November 2024, because a large part of the... And we haven't talked about that uh, because I didn't have my American... I couldn't, couldn't afford to fly him over or her over. Nonetheless, I mean, the, the United States is a key player in all this, and, and Biden's role has been crucial. The U.S. role has been crucial. The NATO enlargement has been driven by, uh, by the U.S. But what happens next year in the presidential elections, it will have an enormous impact, and that is clearly being perceived all the way around the world today. Presidents matter in important ways. I've got hands that have already gone up. I'm going to try and take as many as possible. Uh, oh, my goodness me, that's far too many. Put your hands down again. Uh, I know, no, I'm only joking. I'll start with the gentleman here, and I've got another person over here. So, gentlemen, if you could just stand up. And, and, and Do we have one mic or two? Oh okay. Please, right. make, make um, it brief and question. Yeah. Uh, the question you asked, whether this is a defining moment or not, perhaps would also relate to the title of the discussion today, the war that changed the world. Is mm. the world changed as a result of the war? Change into what and how much? Yeah. It might, we might as well say the war that shook the world rather than changed it because the change is still occurring. Mm. And apropos that change, perhaps I would like to add to what uh, Chris Alden said in respect of the response of the Global South mm. to the war. I think it's actually more bitter and deeper than even Chris <laughs> de described. Mm. There is a lot of accusation of hypocrisy, Chris mentioned it, but double standards and for Ukraine, they shout back, Iraq. For Putin, they shout back, Bush, Blair, Vietnam. So it can go on. So this is this selective, selectiveness uh, has given rise, you know, to, to a lot of uh, uh, unhappiness and, and bitterness uh, in, in the Global South. And, and Second point, when you're fighting for a rules-based order, they say, what rules-based order? A rules-based order which is actually uh, distinguished by non-acceptance of some of the rules, even as a rules-based order was in place. WTA or rules which are not followed. Uh, international laws that had not been followed. So I think Ukraine war has raised these questions and that can bring about change in terms of the Global South structural views towards the West. I would suggest, you know, we might want to look in more deeply uh, into that change. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Very good. Uh, a, have we only got one mic? Yes. Oh my goodness. There must have been cuts at the earlier series. We've got one up here. Oh, have you? Oh, yeah, I won't forget you up there, don't worry. A gentleman over here. Hi, if you want to stand up, yeah. Just... Speak loudly, as they say, yeah. Uh, so, Professor Lankina, you spoke uh, about the complicity of the Russian citizenry in this war, and I was wondering if you felt that the complicity was uh, to some degree justified or at least understandable, considering the fact that these people are living under an authoritarian regime and have to live with fear of being, facing repercussions for speaking out against the actions of their government. Thank you very much. I'll take uh, the lady here, please. Bring, bring the one mic back. There we go, yeah. And I'll, I'll take these three if we could, and then anybody wants to 
enter into the debate, please. Yeah, make, uh, make it brief as possible. That'd yes, be sure. I try. Thank uh, you for the deep discussion about uh, what important I, I, a geopolitical issue of the world at the moment. Uh, actually, it was supposed that, or it is supposing still, that the most geopolitical issue in the year and even in the coming years would be uh, this issue, the war with uh, the war of Russia with Ukraine, mm. for the whole world, um, economically, from the energy perspective, or even security perspective. I have a specific question that <coughs> Professor Alden or even Professor Faulkner maybe I can reply for that. Um, in the sideline of the G20, uh, we had uh, uh, the India-Arabian Mediterranean Commercial Corridor. So according to that, um, if I am right, the Russia's pivot to Asia has failed decisively at, uh, with this declaring this uh, uh, corridor. And so it is ever more visible that Russia um, at the moment is unable or has been unable, okay. yeah, sure, unable to fulfill its uh, self-proclaimed great power task, not only for its you know, limited yeah. region, but uh, in a broader sense in Asia. Okay. So what do you think that uh, about the Russian, maybe this bring Russia to a kind of peace? Okay. Yes. Right. Good. A little, little bit of optimism there at the end. Well, we've got three great questions there broadly. Who wants to take on the question for the gentleman here? I mean, it's actually worse than you were making out, Chris. I mean, it's more, deep, more deeply divided uh, than I think even you suggested, and you were pretty miserable, if you don't mind me <laughs> saying so. Not, not that you're personally miserable, <laughs> yes, but, you know, yes. the analysis you provided of one very deep fragmentation division in the world, and for understandable reasons in many ways. So, Chris, do you want to pick that one up, please? Yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, you, you know, perhaps because of time, I didn't develop it as, as completely as one could, but it is a very, it's very, continues to shock, continues to send messages that, that are such odds with the messaging that we see in the, in the medias here, the politicians here. And I think that that's something that, that uh, Western governments have to come to terms with. The, the future of, that's why I think this is more moment mm. than perhaps mm. uh, we, we believe. Uh, it's comfortable still here. It, mm. uh, it, uh, it's not comfortable in, in the, the global environment as, as a, the global order as it were uh, anymore. The rules are not believed. Mm. So on, on, the, on, on the, um, that last point, I think that also that the, um, I think the only certain outcome actually is the diminishing of this war is, the, is Russia diminished. Russia is not Russia. It's taken a step that will not, will knock it off the great power path. And uh, uh, you know how it will end up is is in, in some way compromised uh, economically, in terms of territory even. All of these things. So all the ambitions that were stated at the beginning, the drive, the nationalism, et cetera, will, will mean. I'm not sure, though, the corridors. I, I, you know, there's so many grand and great schemes that are put <laughs> forward that don't come to too much. There's money that needs to be behind it. There, need, there, there needs to be that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm still a, a little I'll come to the that. end then and come back to you, Robert. Uh, Tamela or Eleanor on, on, on one of the points made about Russia. One of the From questions me. was addressed to me, so I'm yeah. happy to Okay, yeah, whatever. What do you, pick out what about, you want. It's a very good question indeed. There are countless um, Russians who have been jailed and have been tortured because they have protested against the war or indeed against the Putin regime. So I'm not dismissing the bravery of individual Russians who have actually uh, really raised their voices very loudly against you know, the war and indeed border kind of repression and, and uh, autocracy. Um, it's the question really, and, um, and that is something that is discussed a lot in different you know, social media. You know, if you read a post by kind of Ukrainians who are mobilized very actively against the war and, and suffering, uh, obviously, um, in, in this horrific uh, war, um, is one does not see the same extent of resistance as one would expect. I mean, 
Other countries have also witnessed repression. Look at Iran. We have a scholar from Iran here in the audience who asked one of the questions. You know, how many victims, how bravely people have mobilized over and over again in far larger numbers, despite the repressions. And Belarus, compare in proportion to the population, the numbers of people who have come out to protest against the Lukashenko regime is probably far higher than what one saw even in 2011, 2012 mobilizations in Russia against the Putin regime. That was well before even the massive uh, repressive machinery kicked in. And that, I think, is because of these kind of social divides within Russian society that preclude people with, from identifying with their neighbors, with, with a broader kind of civic cause in the same way that the Ukrainians, for instance, identify with you know, the future of Ukraine. They have a kind of broader national purpose that motivates them in a way that, Rush, that is not the case in Russia. Because of these kind of historical divides that I talk about in my book and I talked about in my lecture that most of us don't quite appreciate that Russia is a deeply class-riven, deeply divided society. And, and, and so it makes it very, very difficult for the mass to unite behind what the small percentage of loud intelligentsia might be you know, protesting uh, or, or, or kind of campaigning or advocating. So I think that would be my explanation for mm. this, but certainly I think that's... Yeah, great. Uh, Ellen, did you want to follow up on anything there, please? Um, I just wanted to come to the argument of hypocrisy <clears throat> and selectiveness. I'm not sure that question was um, intended for me, but... Um, that's it. I don't, like, my, my, I'm gonna, not going to answer that question in, in relation to what I think states in the Global South should think or people in the Global South should think, but I do hear that argument in the Global North as well and I kind of want to put out my position on it, which is that, to me, this idea, like, why should we care about Ukraine because we didn't care about Iraq, we didn't care about Syria, we didn't care about blah, 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 is like saying, okay, so you were beaten as a child by your parent, so you're going to continue to beat someone else, right? Like, that's a totally morally bereft argument for me. Like, if we can care about Ukraine and we can care about conflicts and, the, and war in the future, we can create a better future where we actually take these issues seriously that are happening right now in, to cre in, in order to create that better future. We don't have to punish states because other states made bad choices in the past. We can condemn Iraq, but to be honest, aside from arguments that Russia makes about its actions now and legitimizes its actions, I kind of see it as irrelevant. Not irrelevant for the world order and where we are right now, but Ukraine is not responsible for what happened in Iraq and it shouldn't be held responsible. And I, I, the juxtaposition makes me really uncomfortable in, in regards to like how people in the global north speak about these things. It is not responsible for Palestine. It is responsible for a counteroffensive against insurgent Russian forces that should not be there. Thanks, Elena. Great. And Robert, over to you. Yep. I, I'd like to carry on there. Eleanor, I agree with you um, up to a point, but I'd like to even push that argument further against the gentleman who, who raised hypocrisy against uh, the Western's position here. And I have a lot of time for hypocrisy. I think it, it is responsible for a lot. Um, and and I, I can see the point of, of many developing countries who say that, you know, we've been here before, we've been asked to support the North on certain issues, and we've not had anything in exchange for our positions that we demand. So you could go further. Hypocrisy has a long history. The whole system has been described as organized hypocrisy. And yeah, I accept all that. But the question I have, and here I'd like to push back at emerging economies and emerging powers who make that argument, is you can't, on the one hand, stake out a claim to assume a, greater, a position of greater power and responsibility in the international system. And on the other hand, when a country is invaded, when its sovereignty is breached, when it is when it is violated in, in the most base way, you can then not cite hypocrisy by other powers and, and let them sort it out. You've got to choose here. And I think the choice for countries like India, for Brazil, South Africa, is if you go in with Russia in the BRICS uh, uh, grouping and try and deepen those ties, you cannot at the same time stand up then for sovereignty, human rights, and other rights that you might want to claim against others in the future. That is a fundamentally flawed position. So hypocrisy, yes, but then perhaps you need to endorse it full on and accept that, that even the global south is prone to it. Could I, we, we're coming fairly close to what has been, I think, an excellent discussion. Could I pose another broad question for everybody here? And it, it kind of comes back to the thing I've been very interested in. 
something we've not talked about because it wasn't on the agenda for this evening but needs to be mentioned, and that is the role of China, the role of China in this, because, in fact, before the war, and in fact, certainly at the time of the Crimea in, in, uh, intervention of 2014, you mentioned, Ellen, and others, you know, Russia and China were getting very, very close together. And, and by the way, this is a relationship that goes back to 2001 when they signed their first treaty. In fact, if you want to trace it back all the way, it actually goes back to somebody that nobody in Russia likes talking about today called Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev, who actually did the initial relationship to build, rebuild, renew ties with China after the terrible period of the Cultural Revolution and the collapse. It is true, as I think one of you said, I think it was you, Tom, I can't remember, saying, well, you know, Russia wanted to be a great power. It aspires to be a great power. Putin says it is a great power, and you've got to respect us as a great power, but nonetheless the paradox of its position is it may actually have diminished its position in the world, which I think one or two of you were hinting at. But if, if it is diminishing as a great power then as a good IR cynic, and as many of us are on this at least, or not too cynical, you've got to ask, well, who picks up the pieces? Who benefits? And it looks to me, unless I'm being totally naive, that maybe the great winner of all this is going to be China. Um, and now, I'm not, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't believe in it. China does what it does exactly for its own national interest. It's a rising power and does what rising powers have always done, you know, which is claim more, claim more space, claim more voice, and get as many countries as possible, dependent on it. The United States did it, the British did it in the 19th century in some senses. China's no different. So I'd just be interested too, we could reflect on that in a much wider, in a much wider discussion, that at the end of all this, it seems to me maybe one of the key actors in this, which is not acting in the military sense, but maybe benefit in the very long-term sense, is going to be China. And the other thing, which I mentioned very briefly, and we will bring comments to an end now, again, I, I do bring it back to the United States, and the role of the United States, which has been highly criticized, certainly by Putin, certainly by China. In, in some senses, the war in Ukraine, contra to what Ellen was saying, it's not against you, Ellen, but you know what's being said, this is not a war against Ukraine, or in Ukraine, this is a war against the United States and NATO, and that's how, but it, it, in a way, Putin constructs it in that way for very good reasons, because at the end of the day, I think he realizes that in the balance of power in the world, it is still the United States. Whether you think it's in decline or not, I don't, by the way, but that's a larger question. But nonetheless, it is the US which has been playing the key role. This is why everybody yesterday or the day before was so concerned about the closing down of the American government, the three billion that didn't go to Ukraine, which will go to Ukraine. That's why everybody's so concerned, or some are concerned, I'm concerned, by the way, about what happens in November 2024. So in a way, it is going to come back, you know, to the, who are and will remain for a very long time in the future the two key actors in the international order, namely the United States on the one hand and the People's Republic of China on the other. With those closing comments, I will bring this to an end. Thank you for putting all your hands up. We've tried to answer as many questions as possible. Could you put your hands together to thank all our great panelists and people?